Okay, guys, so this is a quick overview of chapter 26. This is the immune system defenses, right? So, uh, big ideas here are the immune system is fighting off infections and cancers pretty much all the time. Um, it involves many different organs, the bone marrow, thymus, um, lymph node, spleen, and of course, um, your tonsils and your appendix, they are also made of the same tissue as well. So, here are the lymphatic organs, as I just mentioned. You can see what these vessels do. They basically just do a filtering for the body. So, um, bone marrow is one of those things that makes the red blood cells. The spleen, the thymus, those, the thymus is where the white blood cells are made and so on. So, uh, quite a bit of this stuff is passed through the lymphatic system, and that's why it's such a big portion of this uh, immune system. So there's different types of cells. It's important to know what each one does, but uh, the biggest ones you're going to see quite a bit, um, they're the macrophages. Those are the ones that are there for inflammatory responses. Um, you're going to see quite a bit of the uh, mast cells. And then the ones that fight disease that are super important are going to be like those uh, lymphocytes and the T cells and the B cells. So we'll get to those in a bit. Now, the big organs, right? So the red bone marrow produces blood cells. Um, it's going to be um, the most important part because um, at the kind of at the he heads of the bone, there's quite a bit of spongy space, and that's where those red blood cells are made. So for adults, that's in the sternum, the ribs, the clavicle, um, vertebral column, and the ends of the humerus, That's where you're, and the femur. That's where you're going to see quite a bit. Um, and so the lymphocytes, they differentiate um, because they basically go to the bone marrow and that's where they complete their maturations and so the T and the B cells they produce those antibodies and they mature depending on where they are so the B lymphocytes are in the bone marrow T lymphocytes are in the thymus so what does the thymus do? Well in children it's bigger um, but then uh, when we get older it actually shrinks down and it's gonna help mature those T cells so about 5% um, ever leave the T cells because they react on whether or not they notice the cells are either part of the self or not, right? So that's one of those ways that they figure out what's going on. And once they do do their job, they die, okay? And then the lymph nodes themselves, they are basically the filters of all this and they are filled in the sinuses and they are basically there to kind of keep everything lubricated and making sure that it's constantly fighting infection. Okay, and so then the spleen, that one filters the blood. You've got these two types of pulp in there, red and white. That's where you're gonna get those red blood cells passed through, and the lymphocytes are gonna be engaged in fighting infections and cancers pretty much their whole time. So we can live without a spleen, but then you can be, have more infections over time because you don't have those uh, pulps to create and keep those blood cells uh, young, so to speak. So when we're talking about immunity, we have to be able to repel these things. We have to repel stuff in our own body, like cancer. And then we have to repel stuff from the outside. And so if we're talking about a non-specific uh, immunity, that's going to be just something that helps us kind of fight off everyday stuff. Specific immunity is going to be when you have a disease and your body notices what's called an antigen and it fights it off for you. So, and then once you notice, your body notices that antigen, it pretty much remembers it forever. That's the benefit of our system. Okay, so we're talking about defenses. We're going to start with non-specific. Basically, it's the idea that the body is always trying to defend against outside uh, infection, but it's not going to be something that's specific to that type of infection. So um, we'll talk about those in a second. So the first thing that you want to do is barriers to entry, right? Your skin is your big deal. And then, of course, Beyond your skin, the mucus your body produces helps you get rid of that stuff. Now, some bacteria and viruses actually use this to spread. So think of the common cold, right? You get the cold, you um, end up with a lot of runniness, um, some you know, gross uh, fluid coming out of your nose and sometimes your eyes and your mouth. That's the body fighting all that stuff off. Those secretions are helpful, but... The downside is that it's how you spread the disease, right? And of course, your oil glands are there to help kill and destroy um, certain bacteria as well. So those things are your first line. All right, so here's a uh, layer of your skin. And so you can see how um, it is basically there to keep stuff out, right? You've got your hair shaft, your epidermis. You've got the oil glands in there, the sweat glands. All that stuff is there to make sure nothing gets in and stop daily bacteria from getting in 
to your system and invading your organs and muscle tissue. Then of course you've got your upper respiratory tract. That's going to be aligned with the ciliated cells. That's how um, something like the uh, coronavirus actually um, ends up infecting that upper respiratory tract where all that mucus is and stuff like that. So when people cough, that's why we have social distancing. The point is to be six feet away so that you don't get all that stuff on you. And of course your stomach fights that off as well with pH, kills certain bacteria from foods. And then of course we've got bacteria in our intestines. Ladies have them in their vaginas um, and other areas to prevent pathogens from multiplying and getting in where they're not supposed to be. So the first thing your body does, is it has an inflammatory response. Now the purpose of all this is to do a couple things. You get redness, heat, swelling, and, lot, and typically pain, right? The point is you've got these histamines that make the capillaries, those little tiny vessels, they dilate, they get wider, so they get more permeable, and that blood flow causes the skin that gets red and warm, okay? That permeability allows fluid to escape, and that's helpful because it gets rid of whatever infection or area that's been overstimulated, right? And so, unfortunately, that swollen area is usually around a nerve ending, and that's why you get pain, right? So uh, one of the first ways to get rid of all this is the neutrophils, which is a type of blood cell. They're phagocytic white cells. They come in, they enclose those pathogens, and they digest the cells for us. So it's not really looking for certain things. It just happens to be there. Okay, and so here's how it works, right? So the first thing is you have a barrier to entry, right? Make sure nothing gets in. Then you've got these protective proteins to make sure nothing gets past it. You've got phagocytes that are there and ready to kill, and then you've got the inflammatory response, right? So if something gets in, like these little yellow and red dots, they'll get in. You've got the dendritic cells, the little uh, extensions here. They start to try to wrap it up. The macrophages will come in and try to collect those um, you know, outside uh, microbes. And then from there, your neutrophils come in and they try to digest them as well. Okay, if that doesn't work, then you've got that uh, swelling inflammatory response. That's this side over here. So that is gonna be your last line of defense. So if that does occur, you end up building up histamines. If you have an allergy problem, then what they do is they'll give you an antihistamine so you don't have that issue. We'll talk about that towards the end as well. But the whole point is what we call a complement system. The idea is that you've got blood plasma proteins and those things are able to tell you whether or not you can amplify that response and make it bigger, or you can sometimes have it um, attack, uh, attack with these antibodies to make sure that certain things don't, uh, don't end up proliferating in the cells. Okay, so you've got these blood plasma proteins. That's an important thing. They're actually trying that with the coronavirus, that once you can um, get infected with this disease, if you get well, the idea is you'll have those pl plasma proteins that you can use to give to someone else and they might be able to fight the disease off. Now it's in the early stages, it may not work, right? So we're hoping that is possible, but we never know. Now let's say you end up with like a blister of some sort with pus in it. That's the dead neutrophils, cells, the bacteria itself, and of course some living white blood cells that are killing the infection. So yeah, that's what comes out of you if you've got like a pussy wound or some sort. So uh, how this works, you've got those complement proteins, they come in, they kind of help figure out what's what, and then that will help attack the cell that you're trying to get rid of. So we do have these natural killer cells. Basically their job is to go around and look for something that is not what we call the self, right? So our cells have certain membranes and proteins, and these natural killer cells will look for those that don't have those proteins, and they will attack and kill them. So that's a good thing. They're your general um, immune system. Now, the point is our immune system has gotten good at responding to certain things. So if you get a type of sickness, like let's say you have uh, measles, right? If you have measles and you can survive that, your body will then respond if you end up coming in contact with measles again. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so that's an important thing here. So if we can notice a pathogen, a foreign cell, or even a cancer cell, then that's what we call those outer proteins called antigens. The body will then react because it knows it's not part of itself and that's when it'll kick into gear and create those um, receptors that, or create those um, 
cells using those receptors from the antigen. So usually what we're talking about here is B and T cells, okay? So if we get measles, like I mentioned, we don't get it again because if that comes back, then our body will look at it and say, all right, time to make those cells that kill the measles. And that's how it works. So that's the great part is those T cells, they mature and they're only produced whenever needed, right? So they create those cells that kill those antigens as well, okay? And so our B cells, they go in and they do the antibody response. So what we're looking at is um, we want to be able to see if something has that B receptor. So the idea is that once something comes in, the body creates these things called cytokines and it makes these things called memory cells, okay? Memory cells, their job is to identify something. And once it's there, so the body will do two things at once. It'll kill the cell that's invading, but then it will also make a memory cell so that later on, if those invaders come back, the body is ready and it will be able to kick into gear really fast. Look at it right here. There's a really good diagram. You got the antigens on the edge of the pathogen, right? Those are their proteins. And our B cells come in with the cytokines and they recognize what our foreign body is, right? And what they'll do is they'll do two things. The first part is they will then create these plasma cells that will make the antibodies and they will mark the pathogens with those antibodies and say, all right, other cells come in and let's kill this thing. But at the same time, it'll start to make these memory cells that contain those outer antibodies so that it's ready when more come in. Okay, so it does two things at once. That's a really great thing. And so our plasma cells, they uh, basically tend to have these um, rough endoplasmic reticulums and they make those secreting antibodies so that we can get them ready for a specific pathogen, right? Um, the memory cells, again, they're for the long-term immunity. We want that because once the threat is gone, you can then create those and then once something's ready to go, we have the antibody so that we can start to fight that infection off again. Okay, so again, B cells, they do the antibody response. They are produced and they become mature in the bone marrow. Um, they go in the lymph nodes, they recognize the antigens, and they produce those secreting plasma cells as well as memory cells at the same time. Okay, and so what is an antibody? An antibody is basically these immu immuno uh, let me say it again, immunoglobulin proteins that combine with those specific antigens, right? So those reactions can look at different ways, but the idea is it makes a complex that marks it for destruction. So if you look at it, you've got these antigens there, the square, the half moon, and the three uh, circles. Those things are there and the body will recognize them depending on what they are, and it'll create a specific antibody for it. So this uh, cell, for example, it has the antibody for the square, but not for the circle and the half moons yet. So it'll have to create those later. So this, and this cell is ready to fight off those types of antigens really easily. But the others, it will have to take time and make those cells later. Okay, and so what do we need this? Blood types are important. We use blood types now um, to identify whether or not someone is related and things like that. But the point is that a blood type is just whether or not you have certain antigens, right? So you can't just take my blood or your blood and automatically transfer and it works because we have certain a and B antibodies, and if you don't have certain ones, then you can then you can't accept or you can't take the other types of blood cell uh, blood blood uh, types. So let me show you what I mean. So if you've got type A, right, you have on your red blood cells the A antigen. So your um, cells would be attacked by another body that is going to recognize the A antigen, right? Your body is also going to create the anti-B antibodies, which means, so you're only able to take type A and type O blood because O has no antigens, okay? And so that's why those people can take both. Now, if you got type B, it's the opposite. You have the B antigens, your anti-A, and you can only take B and O, okay? If you type AB, you have the antigens for both and 
you have uh, neither of those antibodies because you have to be able to handle both of them. So you're what you call the universal donor or universal um, uh, acceptor, excuse me. So if you have AB blood type, you can accept anybody else's blood, okay? Now, if you're type O, you don't have those antigens, you are the universal donor because nobody is going to recognize your cells as your blood cells as bad, so they'll keep it. Unfortunately, you can only take type O because you have the antibodies for both. Okay, so that's the difference, and that's why we need those. So that's a way to be able to um, make sure that your body gets the right blood cells. So when we're talking about T cells, how do those work? Those T cells, they leave the thymus and they're ready to go and find whatever they need. So the antigen is going to be presented to them by these APC cells, antigen presenting ones. And those T cells are now going to be activated once they get to that. And then they're either going to be cytotoxic or they're going to be helper T cells. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a second. So here's what we do. The body does, it creates these viruses or the body uh, has these viruses and it turns in these APC cells, the macrophages. Well, the virus inside is figured out. And then what happens is there's two types. There's helper T cells. These are the ones that help create more of those receptors to find the viruses, okay? And so with all these helper T cells, they're able to find them and bring them in to the macrophages. That's the important part here, okay? Now, if you're cytotoxic T cells, those are the ones that have these storage uh, vacuoles. They have these things called perforants. And their idea, their whole thing is to attack virus infected cells and cancer cells. So if they cannot remove the virus, then the cytotoxic T cells will go in and they will kill those cells. Okay. The helper T cells, again, as I mentioned, they're going to make those um, immune cells or those immune types like macrophages, B cells, and help them do their job. Right. Now, when you have HIV, those helper T cells can be damaged by the virus, and that's why you end up with AIDS. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well. But here's the cytotoxic T cells, right? So you've got these target cells that have been infected. It's no longer able to fight off the infection. And so the cytotoxic T cells comes in. It has this perf perforin, okay? And it uses that to break down the, um, the edges or the membranes of those target cells. And then eventually it destroys it so that your body does no longer have, no longer has the infection in its cells. Okay. And so there's different characteristics, but again, there, it's important to know that you're either going to be a helper T cell or you're going to be a cytotoxic T cell. Okay. Now, if you end up having to have an organ transplant, like let's say you are unfortunate enough or fortunate enough to get a heart transplant, your body is likely going to reject those cells because of the cytotoxic T cells. It's going to recognize it as not part of itself. So you have to be able to live your life with what are called immunosuppressive drugs. The idea is your life is going to be in a state where you can't have your immune system fighting off the organ that's keeping you alive. So you have to have that uh, shut down and it inhibits the response of those T cells so it weakens your immune system. Right now we're talking about coronavirus, people who are specifically going to be uh, harmed by that virus are going to be those who have no immune system to fight it off. So um, you can have immunocompromisation for immunocompromised uh, immune systems um, for many different reasons, but one of those is people who have organ transplants, they're going to have to stay away and stay out of public because otherwise they'll end up with this virus and it will be bad. Okay, so how does immunization work, right? We're all waiting for the vaccine for coronavirus, which may take a while to build. But the way it works is your body is going to be exposed to the virus or some sort of virus uh, particle and it's going to start to create the antibodies that's needed so that you can fight it off later and that's what a vaccine does so um, polio was removed this way right people were it was a polio was a virus that um, attacked the cells in the spinal cord and vaccines were made and now polio is gone it has been eradicated because the vaccines were 
um, successful, and now there's no more of those viruses. It's gone completely. So that's a good thing. Now we can do what's called active immunity. The idea is that the vaccine basically causes your uh, body to make the antibodies, get it ready, and then sometimes, depending on the disease, you have to get a booster to help get it ready even more. Okay, but the idea is that you're basically creating the memory cells for B and memory cells for T so that you can have this, but occasionally you need to have a booster shot to help it uh, continue to be in your immune system. So here's how this would work. The first exposure would happen at zero days and it would create a tiny amount of antibodies. Now your body may not let that last and a couple months later it'll go away, but then you get what's called the booster shot and that then creates tons of antibodies and those can last for months or years on end. And that's a good thing. Okay, now we have passive immunity. That's something I mentioned earlier. They're trying to have prepared antibodies. People who have gotten this disease for coronavirus, they're hoping that they have those antibodies and that we can take the plasma from them and give them to someone who is sick and that plasma will have the uh, antibodies and the immune system will use them and then fight off the virus. The downside is it's temporary. So you're not going to be able to make memory cells this way. That's why it's called a passive immunity. It's basically like a medicine for the one time. So this happens a lot with babies through the placenta or breastfeeding. Um, they get quite a bit of those um, to be able to fight off diseases, right? And patients who get an unexpectedly exposed disease, that's something that they've been trying to do. So that's why this new novel coronavirus, we're trying to fight it off that way. Um, we don't know if it's successful long term uh, or even short term, but they're trying it in some cases. So what are some problems, right? Um, if you have allergies, that is where your immune system kicks in way too fast. And so you would not really want that to happen. So if you've got, if you're allergic to like pet dander or pollen, basically what happens is the allergen comes in and the cytokines create those T cells and macrophages and it causes a reaction much faster than you would normally want, right? So pollen are like these, these come in and that can cause a sneeze and that can cause swelling. Um, it can lead to watery eyes, things like that. If you have extreme problems, that's when you may need to get an EpiPen, um, an epinephrine sh shot, excuse me, because that will end up fighting off the infection or the uh, reaction, because it's not really an infection at the same time. Okay, and so that's what happens. You've got this histamine re um, release, and so you can have kind of very short um, reactions like swelling, itchiness, things like that or you can have life-threatening things where it's drop in blood pressure, okay? So one of the ways we test for this is through tuberculosis. That's a delayed allergic response. Basically, they um, give you a little bit of the virus, okay, um, on your body, uh, not virus, maybe it's bacteria, excuse me, and they'll put it on your arm and they'll have you come in and if you're um, positive for it, then your skin will be red and darkened and then you've probably been exposed to TB at some point in your life. Right. Another example of this is contact dermatitis. So if you've got ever been attacked by, uh, if you've ever been itchy from poison ivy, jewelry or cosmetics causing your skin to itch or turn green, those are the same type of reactions. There's delayed allergic responses. Now the big ones are autoimmune diseases, right? So if you've got um, myasthenia gravis, okay, that's neuromuscular problems, muscular or multiple sclerosis, that's where your nerve fibers break down, okay? Lupus is another one. Lupus is where you're going to get different symptoms, but basically it's kidney damage that's happened, right? Then you get rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis uh, where your joints are affected because you end up uh, producing too much of that uh, synovial fluid. Okay, so that can happen as well. And then, of course, the big one is AIDS, right? HIV is the virus that can infect your T cells. AIDS is when your immune system has now been compromised and you may die from smaller infections. Okay, so the virus itself doesn't kill you, it just harms your immune system and then something else can kill you, right? And so nowadays there's a lot of therapies that you can take that reduces your number of HIV viruses and so you may never contract AIDS. This has happened quite a bit. People with HIV are now living into their 60s and 70s because they're taking medicines that are slowing down the number of uh, virus particles in their blood 
so they never lose their T cells. Their T cells are doing well. Okay. Um, and again, it's transmitted through sexual contact. It's a fluid disease, right? So if it's not saliva, but things like seminal fluid, blood, um, people who are drug users end up with quite of this. And of course, babies born to HIV infected women can end up with HIV. Um, there was actually a case a few years back where they cured a baby of HIV because it was so small in virus numbers. They were able to give it medicines that killed the viruses that it had so that baby was effectively cured of HIV. That was the first time it ever happened. But that's not something you can do with an adult because their virus numbers tend to be very high. Okay, and so that's how it works, right? So you've got HIV, the number goes up, and immediately your, T, your helper T cells drop. And then as the virus goes up, your T cell number will drop as well. So now they have drugs that will stop this because HIV is what we call a retrovirus. So it starts with RNA, okay? Pardon my bad handwriting with my mouse here. And that then goes to DNA, okay? So it needs a special protein to be able to make this happen. We can give it medicines that kill that protein because we don't use that. We don't have RNA turning into DNA in our body. That's the one difference it does have. That's what makes it so hard to fight a virus. Those outer proteins of a virus, that capsid, they basically look like the host. So when they look like the host, there's no fighting it. So that's how a virus works. It's not really alive. It's just got particles that are similar to its host, and it's able to use that to infect. Okay, and so we've been able to um, fight off HIV, and of course it is preventable. The number one way to prevent it is going to be through abstinence, right? Avoid having intercourse. Um, and of course, if you do have intercourse, it's better to limit your number of partners, right? If you have the same partner um, and you don't, and neither one of you is uh, doing extra uh, curricular activity, so to speak, then you're not going to have to worry about um, HIV. Of course, the other problems that you can have are when you have IV drug users, um, anal rectal intercourse is going to be uh, a big problem because that's where the lining of the rectum ends up tearing. And so there's when the seminal fluid and the blood mix, that's where those T cells uh, can get in there through infection. Um, and if can, again, if you do have intercourse, to use latex condoms. Uh, oral sex can also be a means of transmission. And of course, avoid using alcohol and drugs that will prevent you from controlling your own uh, decisions and behavior of maybe getting in contact with someone who has HIV. So, but that's the immune system in a nutshell.